Hey everybody, I'm Max and I'm going to be talking about fast and extensible equality saturation using a tool we've built called EGG. And right from the get-go, EGG stands for eGraphs Good. So hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you'll understand what an eGraph is and you'll agree with me that they are super cool. So let's get started. Uh, basically, I want to put the whole talk up front in one slide. So we're going to start with a little background on eGraphs and equality saturation and why these are really cool uh, data structure and uh, technique to build term rewriting systems, whether you want to build an optimizer or an equivalence checker or what have you. And then we're going to talk about our two, two big contributions uh, in this work, which are deferred invariant maintenance, which is a way to make equality saturation faster by amortizing some of the work that you have to do to maintain the data structure invariance of the e-graph. And the second is called e-class analyses. And this is a technique that makes equality saturation more extensible. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that later. And then finally, I want to talk about EGG, which is the tool that we built that reifies these techniques. Uh, and it's a really cool tool. Uh, it makes it really fast and easy to get started with eGraphs and equality saturation. And a lot of people have been building on it. And I want to show you some of the case studies uh, that have been using EGG to do some cool stuff. So hopefully by the end, uh, you can take, it, uh, take home the message that uh, equality saturation is a really cool technique. And if you have a problem that looks like you have an expression and you want to turn it into another expression, then you should really consider using EGG. All right, let's get started with some background. Term rewriting is the bread and butter of a lot of the things we do in programming languages, uh, whether it's optimization, where you want to turn one term into an equivalent but better term, or equivalence checking, wherein you have two terms and you want to check whether they're equivalent. And for both of these problems, you can solve it by rewriting it. You can either rewrite a term into a better term, or you can you know, try to rewrite the ter terms into each other or into some, uh, some identical term to prove that they are equivalent. Now, no matter what you're doing with rewrites, there will be some useful rewrites, rewrites that will help you get done whatever you're trying to get done, and there will be some less useful rewrites. Now, I've put these rewrites uh, here labeled useful and not so useful, uh, but these labels are only useful for this particular problem. Here, we're trying to rewrite a times two divided by two into a. Now, the, on the left-hand side, these are the exact rules that you will need to actually perform this rewriting, and we'll walk through that in a second. But the right-hand side rules are not going to be useful for this, and these will present some pitfalls that rewriting can uh, possibly get you in, and we'll see those after we talk about the happy path. So if things are going right and you have the exact right rewrite rules in the exact right order as I've written them, then you can do the following. So you can apply a rewrite rule by looking for the left-hand side in the term, and that'll generate a substitution. And you can apply that substitution to the right-hand side to get a new subterm. So here we're reassociating multiplication with division, and that puts the 2 divided by 2 together, and then we can cancel that out with a second rule. Note that this rule is actually unsound in general. x divided by x uh, depends on the fact that x is non-zero, and we'll come back to that later in the talk. But it works fine in this case, uh, <coughs> because 2 is non-zero, and then we can uh, cancel out the multiplication by 1 using this final identity. And we're good. So let's look at some of these not-so-useful rewrite rules. So let's focus on the first one. Uh, this is a kind of a classic strength reduction rewrite. We're changing from a rather expensive, uh, relatively expensive multiplication to a much cheaper bit shift by one. Now this is something that you're going to want your compiler to do because bit shifts are, bit shifts are really fast. Uh, but in this case, it's going to not be the right thing. It'll work. It's still semantically equivalent. But we're kind of stuck. Uh, we can't go any further here because we've lost the opportunity to see that uh, the 2 divided by 2 could be canceled. Another thing that can kind of go wrong with certain kind of rewrites is you can get stuck in a loop. So here we have the, uh, we're considering the commutativity of multiplication. And we can, of course, apply that once, and we can apply it again. And here we get stuck in a, in a loop because we're back to the, our original term. And so if you're not careful, you can uh, get stuck in an infinite loop with these uh, rewrites that don't move you along in some particular direction. Now, there are techniques to address this by completing the rewrite system or normalizing it or descending in according to some sort of order, but we're going to talk about a quality saturation and how it handles this in a, in, a, in a different way. And finally, you can not only get stuck in a loop, but you could build an infinite size term. So here we're rewriting a to a times 1 using the final identity, and of course you can keep doing this and build an infinite size term, which is no good. So like I said, these, uh, these rules present pitfalls uh, in general for a quality saturation, but they might be critical in some cases, right? Uh, the, the first one is, is more obvious. This is a rewrite that you will want to do uh, when you want to uh, use cheaper operations like bit shift. 
But the second two might be important for enabling other rules. You might need to commute something or add it multiply one in order for some other really important rule to match. So this kind of begs the question, uh, which rewrite are you supposed to apply when? Uh, and there's a lot of strategies for doing this, but what we're gonna talk about today is a quality saturation, which is basically a technique that says you can apply all of them all of the time, simultaneously. And this avoids the problem of rewrite choice or phase ordering, uh, as it's referred to in compilers literature. And so this simultaneous rewriting is uh, sounds more sounds really, really expensive, but we'll see how the eGraph data structure allows you to do this uh, relatively efficiently. Um, and compactly. So like I said, this is a quality saturation. Uh, this is the technique that was um, presented by Ross Tate uh, and his colleagues in Popple 2009. Uh, and our two key contributions on top of a quality saturation are going to make it faster, and that's going to be using the deferred invariant maintenance that we're going to talk about next, and, and more flexible, and that's going to be using E-class analyses that we'll get to later. But before we talk more about a quality saturation, let's talk about e-graphs, which are the data structure that underlie a quality saturation. Uh, they underlie not only a quality saturation, but also uh, most modern theorem provers. Uh, they were invented by Greg Nelson in the 70s and a similar concept uh, by Dexter Cozen a little earlier. And basically it's a data structure that represents an equivalence relation over terms. And so it's composed of equivalence classes or e-classes, which are sets of equivalence nodes or e-nodes. And these e-nodes are basically operators from your language. Uh, they are things like division or multiplication or, of course, childless operators like 2 or A. And so here's an e-graph that whose root, uh, whose top level e-class represents the term that we've been talking about, A times 2 divided by 2. And if you follow the edges, you'll notice two things. One, you can kind of see the, uh, the, the term that we're talking about, and there's a little bit of sharing. We're reusing the 2. And you'll also might notice that the edges go from E node to E class. That is an operator takes as child, not another operator, but a, a whole family of equivalent operators, uh, an E class, a whole E class of equivalent E nodes. So this isn't a very interesting E graph because there's not any variance in it. Each E class only has a single E node. So we need to grow this E graph. And we can do that by applying rewrite rules. So here is our uh, kind of red herring rewrite from before. It's a great rewrite, but not in this case. Uh, and you can apply it in a very similar way. We're going to search for the left-hand side, x times 2, which, of course, we can find as a times 2. And that generates a substitution, uh, binding a to x. And we can apply that to the right-hand side. And instead of destructively rewriting, uh, like you would do in a, in a normal term rewriter, we're going to instead add this right into the same E class as a times 2. So we're adding this uh, shift operator into the same E class as the times operator because these are the uh, equivalent subterms. And now this E class represents both ways to write that subterm. And going up, we can see the division operator now represents uh, two ways to write the entire term because there are two ways to write the subterm. And we can keep doing this. We can keep writing. Now we're going to apply one of the, one of the good rewrites. Uh, here, the reassociation of multiplication and division. And we don't need to follow this precisely. But one thing that I would like to show off is that you can apply these final two rewrites, which are the cancellation and the identity. And notice that these don't actually add any more E nodes. Uh, you can see they're all gray because they were in the previous E graph. Uh, but what it does do is decrease the number of E classes. So we've actually shrank the E graph, but we've added more information where there are more equivalences, more equivalent terms stored in the E graph. In fact, there's an infinite number. Uh, this top E class, this funny shaped one, which actually has our division node in it, uh, represents the infinite set of terms A, A times 1, A times 1 times 1, and that's because there's a cycle here. This division, uh, th this multiply, multiply operators, left child, is actually the E class uh, which contains it. So that's pretty neat. Another thing that E graphs can do is saturate. And what this means is that if you keep applying these rear rules, you may get to a point where you're not adding any more information to the e-graph. So if you kept applying these rewrite rules, the e-graph wouldn't grow anymore. You wouldn't add any more e-nodes, or you wouldn't be um, <coughs> adding any more e-classes. And this is called saturation. And what this means is that you've effectively learned everything that you could possibly derive from the axioms that you've been using as rewrites. And this is where quality saturation gets its name. You start with an initial term, and you chunk that into an e-graph. And you start cranking these rewrites. And this is going to you know, add more terms to our equivalence ration. And we're going to have a bigger and bigger space. 
And then finally, once we've saturated, we now have learned everything we could possibly learn from those rewrites, and we can extract. Now, extraction is a procedure uh, that we're not going to get into in this talk, which basically allows you to, from a specific E-class, the one that contains your initial term, pick out the best represented term according to some cost function. So now there's a lot of ways to extract. Like I said, we're not going to uh, get into it, but suffice it to say, you basically pick one E-node for each E-class, and that gives you the term uh, that you're interested in. Now let's break down this loop uh, just a little bit more. So the first thing you're going to want to do is find a pattern. So you're going to look for the left-hand side of one of the rewrites that you're going to be um, searching for. And that's going to generate a substitution. And you're going to apply a match by adding it, uh, adding the substituted term into the e-graph where the match was found. And then finally, what we have to do is restore some data, so, some data structure invariance. Like many data structures, the e-graph has invariance. Uh, the, a really important one being congruence. The equivalence relation that an e-graph represents is also a congruence relation. And here's the definition of congruence as a refresher. And this is really handy because congruence can help you find a lot more equivalences uh, in your e-graph. And finally, of course, we're going to run this loop uh, a bajillion times. This is the hot loop of equality saturation. So if we want to make equality saturation faster, which we do, uh, we're going to have to do something about this loop. So that brings us to um, our insights, our, our contributions in this work. And we'll start with deferred invariant maintenance. And again, this is going to be how we're going to make equality saturation faster. But first, let's come back to equality saturation and let's look at it as pseudocode. So I'm going to write some pseudocode up here. And it's important to actually follow this line by line because uh, there are some interesting, interesting things to look at. So we're going to define equality saturation. It's just a procedure that takes in our initial expression and a set of rewrites. And uh, just like in the box diagram, we're going to first create our initial e-graph. And now we're going to start doing our iterations. And we're going to do these uh, while the e-graph is not saturated. So we're going to stop once it's saturated or some other timeout is hit. Now for each rewrite, we're going to e-match. Uh, e-matching is the name of the procedure that searches for uh, a pattern inside an e-graph. So we're going to e-match for the uh, left-hand side of the rewrite. And that's going to generate a bunch of substitutions, each paired with the E-class where the match was found. OK? Now we can add the substituted right-hand side to the E-graph. And when you add something to an E-graph, it goes into a new E-class. So finally, we have to merge that new E-class with the E-class where we found the substitution. And that constitutes applying uh, the rewrite. So we can do that over and over until finally we can uh, saturate and then return the, uh, the extracted best term. OK, so let's highlight some parts of interest here. First, there's uh, the e-matching part is where we're principally reading the e-graph. This is where we're searching the e-graph, uh, not modifying it though, and we're finding the substitutions. And then for each substitution we're finding, we're doing a little bit of writing. Uh, we're adding a new term and we're combining e-classes, which is of course modifying the e-graph. And whenever you modify a data structure, um, you might you have to make sure to restore the data structure invariance, uh, principally congruence in an e-graph. And so each of add and merge is going to have to do a little bit of work to make sure that those invariants those invariants are maintained. And so what can we say about this uh, equality saturation pseudocode? Well, one thing that you might observe is that rewrites are actually ordered, uh, which might feel unintuitive, uh, but the way uh, equality saturation is structured, as I've shown, rewrites earlier in the list can affect what rewrites later in the, in the list might find. And that's because they can apply and add new things to the e-graph, and then the later ones might see that. Another characteristic of this structure is that the reading and writing is interleaved. We're constantly alternating between searching the e-graph and modifying it, which means we have to keep restoring those invariants, because uh, these Mod these modification procedures must restore the invariance, otherwise the e-graph is in a broken state because we're about to read it. Now, egg does something a little bit different. Most of this code is the same, but I'm going to highlight the different parts. First of all, we group all of the reading together. So in a, in a single equality saturation iteration, all of the reading for all of the rewrites is done in one place. And notice we haven't modified the e-graph yet. So basically, for each rewrite, we're e-matching uh, finding all of the, the match substitutions, and we're just putting those into a list. We're not touching the e-graph yet. 
Now, once we have all of those, we've done all the reading we want, now we can do the writing. So for each of those matches, we're going to do basically the same thing. We're going to add the substitute right-hand side and then combine that new E-class with the E-class where we are, um, <clears throat> where we found the left-hand side. And then later on, we have this procedure called rebuild. And what this is doing is actually allowing us to break invariance during this writing phase. So in Egg's world, eGraph add and eGraph merge don't respect the data structure invariance. Uh, the client is actually responsible for manually restoring the data structure invariance by calling this rebuild procedure. But when you're using a quality saturation, uh, which Egg provides for you, this is done once per iteration automatically. So we're deferring invariant maintenance instead from uh, every merge or every add to once per equality saturation iteration, which is many, many, many fewer times. Another side effect of this change is that the read phase is easy to parallel. It's not easy to parallelize. It's all grouped together now. So if you wanted to parallelize by rewrite, uh, that's rather trivial. And so this is what we call deferred invariant maintenance. And go, coming back to our box diagram, the way things look now are we find all patterns, okay? And then we apply all of the matches. So instead of finding these one at a time, we can now do all of them. And remember in this bottom part where we're applying all matches, we're allowing the invariants to be broken. So instead of res uh, restoring them immediately, we apply all of the matches and then we restore all of the invariants at once, okay? And what's actually happening in this invariant restoration uh, looks a lot like the uh, congruence closure algorithm presented by uh, Downey, Sethi, and Tarjan in 1980. Uh, and the innovation here is not so much how we're performing uh, congruence closure, because that's one of the things that um, an eGraph has to do, but when. We're deferring it until we're done with all of the mutating operations we want to do in that equality saturation iteration. So is this faster? Uh, yes. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a uh, <clears throat> the benchmarks in the egg test suite, so one dot per test. And if the dot is below the line, then egg's approach is faster. So what are we looking at here? The x-axis is the uh, time it takes in the rebuild every merge paradigm. Rebuilding every merge is basically the conventional way, where you're restoring invariants every time you combine two E classes. And we compare this to the y-axis, which is rebuilding once per iteration. This is the deferred schema uh, that Egg uses by default. And so as you can see, these dots are well below the line, indicating that uh, we're spending a lot less time performing congruence maintenance. That's what we're measuring here. So we can look at the same data another way, and hopefully maybe it'll be a little bit more clear. Uh, these are the same uh, Egg test suites. And what we're measuring here on the x-axis is uh, the tests as uh, as they are applying rewrites. So dots further to the right uh, are applying more rewrites. And then the y-axis is indicating what the total speed up is relative to the conventional approach. So the speed up of eggs approach using deferred invariant maintenance versus the conventional approach of maintaining it all the time. So this dot uh, you can see is at the height of 30x indicating at the very end it's uh, 30x faster um, than the conventional approach. And what the lines behind these dots are showing you is this is as this test is proceeding. So what we can see both in each individual test, but also is just looking at the, the dots as a whole, is that the longer these are running, the more work they're doing, the more rewrites they're applying, the greater multiplicative speed up we're seeing uh, empirically from deferring rebuilds. So why is this the case? So uh, let's try to build some intuition with an example here. So consider an e-graph with the following 2n plus 1 terms. So we're going to have x, and then we're going to have f1 through fn applied to x. So that's n plus 1 terms, and we're also going to have y1 through yn in the e-graph as well. The workload that we're going to be looking at is n merges. We're going to merge x which, with each of the y's. So at the end, x and all the y's are going to be in the same e-class. Now they're all separate. In the traditional paradigm, you have to inspect these f's uh, o of n times to perform hash cons updates. Now in the eGraph, the hash cons is a data structure that is used to ensure everything is deduplicated, and it has to store the canonical representative of each e-class. And basically what, how we're going to get to that o of, o of n squared is that for each merge, the canonical representative of that e-class might change, but also of its any 
enodes that refer to it, any parents. So once we merge x and y1, f of x and f, or f1 of x, all the way through fn of x, might have their representative change. So we have to go look at all n of those f1 through n's for every merge. And so that's, of course, n squared. Whereas if you defer this invariant maintenance, you don't have to do any checking until, it, until rebuild time. Uh, and what that allows you to do is do nothing, basically, um, on each of these merges. All you do is add uh, something to a work list like they do in the, um, in the downy sethi Tarjan algorithm. And then once you call rebuild, then you can finally go look at all of those F1 through Fn's a single time. So you're only doing O of N work here. All right, so that brings us back to our outline, and we can talk about our second contribution, which is E-class analyses. So rewriting is really great. I've talked about it a lot, but there's uh, a lot more to um, program analysis than syntactic rewriting. It's really useful to consider semantics sometimes. Uh, consider concept folding or nullability analysis or any uh, a lot of other program analyses as well. So let's talk about concept folding as an example, because this is something a lot of eGraph implementations or uh, quality saturation implementations have baked in in ad hoc ways. So here's our eGraph as it was before. And in order to do constant folding, we're going to want to attach an, an optional number to each E class. And when we add a new E node, we're going to try to evaluate that E node based on the values, if there are any, associated with uh, the children of that E node. And when we merge E classes, we're going to merge those options together, taking uh, either value if there is one. So let's uh, walk through on this example. We're first going to add the bottom two. Uh, E nodes, these are the, the leaves, and we can't evaluate A, but we can of course evaluate two, and that's about all we can do. You know, next we'll do the multiply. We can't evaluate this one because the left child A doesn't have a constant associated with it, and same thing for the division. But if we were to merge A and two, we can now learn that both of them are now equal to two, and now the uh, this propagates up. The multiplication node now has two constant children, so it can evaluate to four, and likewise for the division, it can evaluate to two. And so let's see how we would formulate this in, in the framework of an E-class analysis. So first, what is an E-class analysis? It allows you to attach a fact to each E-class from some domain D that forms a joined semi-lattice. And we need three operations on that domain D. We need make, and what make does is it makes a new analysis value for the new E-node. So when you're adding a new E node N, you need to be able to produce using make uh, a value D from our domain big D that's going to be associated with the new E class. We of course need a way to join uh, two analysis uh, values uh, from our domain. And this is going to occur when you need to combine the two values uh, when the two E classes are combined. And this needs to respect the semi-lattice laws. And then finally, you can provide a uh, optional function modify uh, which allows you to modify the E-class whenever the analysis uh, value associated with that E-class changes. So let's see how we would do constant folding in this framework. Our domain is just going to be option number. Make is just going to be eval. We're just going to uh, eval if we can, based on whether or not our children uh, have constants associated with them. Join is still the option or, as before. And the only trick here is, we are going to uh, supply a modify function where we add the constant into the E class. Okay, so as it's illustrated here, the constants are kind of trapped in the analysis. They're not actually in the E graph, they're in some side table that is just associated with each E class. And we will actually want to, in many cases, add these constants into the E graph so that they can be matched on by other patterns later in a quality saturation. So E class analysis can do more than uh, just constant folding. It allows you to lift all kind of program analyses up to the eGraph level in a sort of abstract interpretation uh, sort of flavor. Another neat thing that we use it to do is conditional and dynamic rewrites. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can uh, come up with rewrites that are unsound if you can't prove something about their left-hand sides. So x divided by x equals 1 only if you know that x isn't 0. So if you want to use this syntactic rewrite, you need to be able to prove that x isn't 0, and that's something you could do with a non-zero uh, E-class analysis. E-class analysis can also express a bunch of other uh, E-graph hacks that we've seen baked into uh, equality saturation imp implementations in ad hoc manner. 
things about debugging assertions or pruning, which reduce the e-graph um, to try to increase search speed, or extracting things on the fly so you can constantly see the best value associated with each e-class. And when you're using an e-class an analysis, it's nice to have this invariant uh, that Egg provides for you so you can actually understand how the analysis is propagated throughout the e-graph as things are added to the e-graph and things are merged. So what this uh, states is, it's actually quite intuitive, is that for every e-class, the analysis data, d sub c, that is associated with that e-class is the least upper bound, um, and this is where a lattice properties come into play, of the make of all of the nodes in that e-class. So basically, no matter what happened to the e-graph, the data is the same as, as if you just made, called, called make on all the e-nodes in that e-class and merged them together right now. We also guarantee that uh, modifies at a fixed point, which is really nice because if you're doing something like adding or removing e-nodes from an e-class in the modify, you want a guarantee that those have been run at a certain time. And so that's what the e-class analysis invariant gives you. And this invariant is maintained in a similar deferred fashion um, to congruence using uh, deferred invariant maintenance. Okay, so that's our two big uh, intellectual contributions. And we've, uh, of course, reified this in a tool called Egg. Uh, and so let's talk about Egg and, and some of the cool things people have been doing with it. So Egg is a library. Uh, it's a generic library in Rust for uh, e-graphs and equality saturation. It's generic meaning that uh, you can bring your own data types, uh, bring your own language, and whether you want to work with floating point numbers or integers or matrices or, or 3D CAD programs, uh, the things in the e-graph are actually those things, which is really nice when you want to uh, interpret them and use them semantically. It's packaged and documented. There's a tutorial online. Uh, and it's pretty easy to get started using it, and people are building some cool stuff with it. And they are using uh, some, aside from the, the two contributions that I mentioned, there are some really nice features in Egg that'll, that make it uh, easy, easy to use and easy to use performantly. So some of these features are, there's uh, a pre-made customizable equality saturation outer loop. This is basically the loop that I showed you on the slide. But it comes uh, with some extra uh, features like logging and saturation checking, and rule scheduling is actually worth mentioning, one thing that we found that empirically works really well is limiting rewrite rules that uh, apply way too many times. This can help prevent the search space from exploding, and empirically we found it's, uh, it's really good. You can also use custom rewrites. This is where you have a left-hand side that's syntactic, but a right-hand side that is computed at application time. Uh, this can allow you to do all sorts of crazy things, like even invoke a solver to figure out what the right-hand side should be for that rewrite, given a particular substitution from the left-hand side. And batch simplification. Uh, this allows you to run a quality saturation on multiple terms simultaneously. And if those terms have similar structure, you can see a big, big speed up this way. So some folks that have been using uh, Egg, Herbie is a project that uh, improves the accuracy of floating point expressions. Uh, the simplification portion of Herbie got over 3,000 times faster, taking it from a huge bottleneck to almost non-existent in their runtime, which is a, which is a big win. The Spores project uh, <clears throat> is comparing with system, uh, system ML, that's an Apache project, to optimize linear algebra kernels, and it's uh, up to 1.2 or 1.2 to 5x uh, better uh, in terms of the performance of those kernels. We've got an ongoing project that is using it to optimize deep learning uh, compute graphs. And it's not only performing better than the state-of-the-art uh, search procedure, but 48 times faster. So we have a search procedure now that would be fast enough to ship in an actual compiler, which is really neat. And in a totally different domain, uh, the Solinsky project used it for CAD synthesis, uh, and that allowed it to have a really large eval uh, with very small synthesis time. There's a lot of other domains that uh, are using it. And a really cool thing is that each of these domains is uh, using a really uh, a, a feature that is unique to Egg. So Herbie is using the batching feature. Spores is heavily using E-class analyses. Uh, the ML compute graph um, is actually just using the fact that uh, the library is generic. It has to call into a C++ library, and that's something that you can do um, from inside a rewrite, which is nice. And Solinsky invokes a solver in its rewrites, so it's in using those dynamic rewrite features quite heavily. So that's Egg. Uh, hopefully you're convinced that E-graphs are good now. Uh, again, our take-home message is that if you have a problem with an expression on the left-hand side and you want to turn it into something better or can figure out if two expressions are equal, you should really consider using a quality saturation or egg. There's a website with more information. Thanks for listening.